Coming up on this episode of Faz TV. Tackling parasites in livestock. Protecting Scotland's global reputation for seed potatoes. The future of farming policy. And we revisit Ochnoch Troch to look at their second cut silage. Scotland's seed potato industry is a valuable national asset. Scottish seed not only underpins the UK potato supply chain, but is sent around the world to enable high-yielding crops to be produced in challenging environments. Scottish seed potatoes are globally renowned for high health status. This status has been earned over many decades, but continued focus on crop health and development is important if the sector is to retain this position. Research trials are underway in Aberdeenshire, looking at new ways to control virus in seed potato crops. I'm Philip Burgess and I work for a, a partnership called scottishpotatoes.org, which is a partnership of SIUC, the James Hutton Institute and SASA. The role is to, to bring together the research that's going on within those three organisations together and take it out onto, the, onto farm and to farmers and the industry to, uh, so they benefit from, the, from all that research. At SIUC we have uh, the SACAP organisation, the Scottish uh, Agricultural College Association of Potato Producers and within that organisation we use that group to support a wide range of, of trials work. So we have um, many trials this year on everything from PCN control, free living nematode control, herbicides, fungicides, seed treatments and also importantly this year on virus transmission in seed potato crops. Our seed potato certification system uh, has very strict tolerances for disease and the primary uh, reason that we've grown seed potatoes in Scotland is because we have a low incidence of virus in, in potato crops. With ever-changing climates and conditions and things we have seen a small spike in the amount of virus we're picking up in crops and it is important that we get back on top of this. Um, but the, the main reason that uh, virus gets into potato crops is through aphids. So greenfly or aphids uh, carry virus on their stylets, uh, particularly of a virus called PVY, which has various different strains to it. But uh, PVY is what we call non-persistent transmitted virus. So the, an aphid, a very general, ordinary aphid, one that doesn't necessarily infect, uh, grow on potato crops, can pick up this virus just by probing into, a, into a potato, an infected potato leaf, flying onto the next potato, probing into that one, actually deciding that it's not really what it wants to be, where it wants to be. It's not found a carrot or whatever it is that it's trying to find, uh, but it's put the virus into that potato and then that can then infect it and, and carry on. This year we have um, a project on aphid-borne virus transmission in seed potatoes and we have a project which is jointly being conducted with uh, NIAB and SASA and SIUC. Uh, last year in 2020 we had a trial that we uh, performed down in Cambridgeshire under a very very high uh, virus uh, uh, pressure uh, and in this, this year we're repeating the trial again uh, in Aberdeenshire under conditions that are perhaps more directly relevant to the sea potato industry in this part of the world. This trial looks at uh, different um, things we can do in the field such as mulching and the use of uh, intercropping and also the use of mineral oils, a, a different sort of spray application to potatoes that we've used in the past. Spraying continues to be the main protection from pests and diseases but there are concerns over the availability of chemicals in the future. Keep the high health standards that we, we expect of our seed potato growers. Spraying is required. In recent years, we've used a, a range of different uh, traditional plant protection products uh, to control virus. But we are concerned now 
that A, we're losing some of those, they're not being allowed to be used any longer, and secondly, that a lot of aphids are actually um, recorded as being resistant to some of the remaining products. So we're having to reconsider our options, and one of the things we're looking at is the use of mineral oils. Mineral oils uh, have been used uh, in other parts of the world quite successfully to control virus for, for many years. Um, but we haven't been using them in Scotland for, for various reasons. But they have not been uh, up, approved for use uh, and also there's been some concern that they might damage uh, the, the leaves of the potato crop which uh, is a very con a big concern if you're um, uh, trying to inspect a seed potato crop for the presence of virus. So now we're, we're looking at the, the, the use of mineral oils. Um, we we haven't got very many that are available in the UK at the moment, um, but we are exploring through these trials how we might use them, uh, best use them when they do become available to us in perhaps two or three years time. And, and really what we, we're expecting to have to happen is that we uh, spray potato crops from a very early stage in their growth. So now would probably be the perfect time to put on the first spray, and then we'll expect to put on subsequent mineral oil sprays every week. And what happens is that the aphid comes along and it, it just doesn't like the surface of a potato that's uh, co covered in this very thin layer of oil. Uh, so it, it would land on the leaf, it might poke around a bit, but it's just not going to like it. It's not going to penetrate into the, into the potato and so it doesn't transmit the virus and hopefully flies off and finds something else to do. The use of straw mulch is also being trialled as a deceptive measure, tricking aphids into thinking there are no potatoes in the field. Well, the mulch we're, we're talking about is, is work that was originally done, I think, in Switzerland. And what we're using is, is simply wheat straw, which has been placed on the, on the surface of plots before they emerge. Uh, and what happens is that the aphid comes across the potato crop and because of the way it sees, which is different from the way we see, it then doesn't see a contrast in the colours in, uh, in the potato crop. Uh, the, the presence of straw confuses it and it doesn't think there's anything there of any interest to it and it flies over. Well that's a theory anyway and uh, it's been shown to work in, in, in work in other parts of the world and in our Cambridgeshire trial last year it was actually the most successful treatment we had in those, uh, in those trials. It's early at the moment uh, for this trial and so we haven't got any results from, from this year. We're investigating the options at the moment so we're not really at a stage where we're able to, uh, to recommend any particular treatments but one of the things we're looking at is the use of intercropping. Um, we've chosen vetch as, as an intercrop in this trial and so we will expect to see our potatoes growing with rows of vetch in between. And the idea behind this is that it actually, um, uh, the aphids land on the vetch instead of the potatoes and actually it actually cleans the virus off the stylet so it doesn't then transmit into the potatoes. For more information on these trials and other projects, please visit www.scottishpotatoes.org. Last time we visited Ochnoch Troch in Lanarkshire, the farm was under snow. Now that it's summer, they're hard at work cutting silage. It's only been just over four weeks since the first cut of silage was lifted, but they're pushing on with the second cut. So what's farmer Andrew's motivation behind going for second cut so soon? There's a weather window here and uh, there was a fair bit of stuff there so we decided that we would just go for it. Uh, it gets us back into about the same time scales we would normally work at and grass growth has been phenomenal in the last three to four weeks. The colder weather earlier in the year meant that first cut was later than usual but the first cut still yielded well. The first cut was about a week to ten days later than usual so we were getting just the amount of grass growth there's been in the last few weeks. You can see from the grass check figures that grass growth is way above it than the normal for the, or the average over the last two years. So grass has also been jumping. We had a fair old crop yeah. for all or that wee bit later. It, it was just, well it was just touch and go, ground conditions were touch and go. You'll probably see if we put a drone up that there's 
Patches that aren't growing very well since then as a result of a bit of compaction. Slurry and fertiliser were applied right after first cut and all grass is wilted after cutting. It got about 27 units of fertiliser of nitrogen and 3,500 gallons of slurry with a, through a dribble bar. It gets 24 hours and it's all tidied out ready for straight after it's cut. The birds use a contractor with a merger to row up the grass. The analysis has shown a lower silage ash content since using the merger. The same height of the first cut gets uh, from Aga King. So, yeah. The pit at Ochnochtroch has a central tipping point. This is used after first cut to layer the following cuts evenly. It's a fairly long pit so it takes, it's a fair distance to ask a bottle rake man to run if you were going from one end. So. There'll be a, a second try to go on once we get enough stuff in, you'll, you'll butter it one way and then you'll start and butter it the other way and we'll put a tractor on to, to work back and forward, usually a telehandler. Before they get, get a sheet it before they leave. Right, so, so there's no, as, as soon as possible. Yeah, right. keep, keep the air out it. The contractor's chopper has a near-infrared sensor that can measure dry matter as the grass is being chopped. Yeah, it was sitting, I think it was about 28 to 30 dry matter until we got a downpour and there was the stuff that was raked up it didn't really affect that much sitting in a 70 foot was so it didn't really affect that much at all but there was 25 acres still to rake up and uh, it came in about 20 dry matter so what are the plans for the third cut well probably five to six weeks uh, there's long long days of sunshine at this point of the year so it grows very quickly, so there is, it's reasonably green below, it will come back fairly quick I would think. The slurry is booked for Monday so we'll get some fertiliser on it and it will take off again. If you want to find out more about the multi-cut system at Ochnock Troch, look back at Fast TV episode 4. Parasites can cause significant production losses and inefficiencies in livestock farming. Parasites exemplify the challenges and opportunities around climate change. Dr Philip Skews and Dr Fiona Kenyon from Morden Research Institute have been studying the changing behaviours of parasites due to climate change. My name is Philip Skews, I'm a Principal Scientist at the Morden Research Institute in Edinburgh. I've been there for about the last 25 years working on various aspects of sustainable control of parasites in livestock. Parasites are ubiquitous, uh, it's a, a very successful uh, biological life form um, and they cause all sorts of problems for, for humans and animals and the environment. So. Uh, they're a major constraint on efficient livestock production, uh, sheep and cattle. There's a number of different species we encounter in, in Scotland and across the UK. Uh, some are, are really quite damaging and it's important that farmers are aware of them. Your parasites, for example, like nematodirus, which is a, a real problem in spring in the lambs. Eggs are on pasture, they have little larval stages inside them. They're waiting to hatch and what triggers them is a cold spell followed by warming, warming weather in the spring and they all hatch out together and, and can cause real problems. But you've also got things like Haemonchus, which is a, quite a large roundworm, and it lives in the stomach, but it's a blood feeder, and it's a really nasty parasite, and it likes hot, dry conditions, and when it rains, the eggs all hatch. So we have to think about those kinds of conditions too. The liver fluke, which is really quite a large parasite that lives in the liver system of sheep and cattle, about the size of cornflakes when they're adults. They lay lots of eggs, that, again, that go out on pasture in the dung. Uh, they hatch and get into a little mud snail, and they're mud coloured, so they're really hard to find, but they're out there and they spread disease. They actually amplify the fluke infection and release cysts onto pasture, onto the blades of grass that the animals eat, and that causes real problems like liver damage in sheep and cattle, which is, can be very severe and can quite often be fatal. Parasite eggs and larvae are found on pasture, so are influenced by climate change. And there are two aspects to, to, to our focus on climate change. One would be adaptation, how do we adapt to what climate change is bringing? And also, how do we mitigate the impacts that climate change is, is having and that parasites are having on our livestock? So they're exquisitely affected by the climate, by the, the weather patterns, rainfall and temperature. And, and over time, that, that's climate. So we see changing 
patterns of seasonality changing so we see disease out of season it, it pops up in places we don't expect to see so we, places that never had fluke before suddenly the east coast we, we see fluke again we need to be aware of that we need to be monitoring so that's one of the things farmers can do and we would encourage them to do that farmers can do a variety of things to, to monitor parasites you can you can take blood tests for some of the parasitic diseases like liver fluke um, you can also look for clinical signs so look for animals that aren't performing as well as they should be the most convenient test for farmers to use is the faecal egg counting because animals conveniently put uh, parasite eggs out onto pasture in their faeces so these can be extracted and counted at the testing lab so that's a really important thing to do and farmers can do some of that themselves um, it's not too difficult and it does give you some very useful information about what's out there, what's changing, uh, how things are responding to treatment. So you can see how insidious they are, they're, they're out there, they're, they're changing with the climate, they're changing with the pasture management and, and farm management strategies so it's something we need to be aware of uh, and as I say the best tools for that would be around monitoring so we know what we're dealing with and, and faecal egg counting is one of probably the easiest and, and most useful tests that, that farmers can do. I'm Fiona Kenyon, a Principal Scientist at the Mordor Research Institute. I'm interested in sustainable control of nematodes in livestock and also how technology can be used to improve uh, health and welfare monitoring. Parasites are ubiquitous and are on all grazing fields that uh, animals will come across. And one of the main causes is loss production. So although we see, can see clinical signs such as scouring, um, there's, obviously, there's usually a more hidden cost in lost production so the animals don't grow as well and that can affect the efficiency of your farmer practice and the efficiency of how well your animals are growing um, and to be able to target and mitigate against that can really help to improve animal performance overall. So there's lots of methods that we can use to mitigate against parasites. You can go to really good resources are the SCOPs or COWS websites and um, they list all the kind of sources of mitigation that, that can be used. Some of the main ones though would be to think about what you're bringing back onto your own farm. So we know that there's different types of parasites, different species, and they have, you know, the drugs work better or worse in different species. And so you want to be careful about what you bring back to your farm and you can mitigate against that by carrying out effective quarantine when you either have a new stock or return in stock to your farm. You can also think about when you're treating your animals, when you're dosing them, um, to make sure that you use the correct product or a product that's going to work. You can use calibrated equipment to make sure you're given an accurate dose and try and give the dose to the weight of the heaviest animal in the group. You can also check that the drugs have worked by um, collecting faecal samples post-treatment and getting them analysed. Another way that we can use to mitigate against um, parasite infection is by using targeted selective treatments and essentially this is a dosing strategy whereby we treat individual animals within the group rather than treating all animals at the one time. And this works um, in a number of ways. Firstly we know that not all animals in the group are equally affected by the parasites that they're exposed to so some can continue to grow well whereas others start to grow poorly. So by identifying the ones that are growing poorly we can just treat them without affecting the growth rates overall. And also, by just treating those individuals, it helps us to slow the development of wormer resistance. We know that we're not going to get any more new products on the market anytime soon, so we really need to think about how we can prolong the life of doing this. When we did this, we were comparing this targeted to selective treatment approach using short-term weight gain against three other commonly used um, drug treatment strategies and we found that by treating individual animals that failed to reach a minimum baseline target we used about 50% less drenches compared to a monthly treated approach but we didn't see any difference in weight gain so therefore by treating all the animals every month we're actually wasting quite a lot of drench um, which is not giving you a return in terms of increasing or maintaining animal production. So EID handling can be really helpful to help us to be able to actually use targeted selective treatments on farm in a practical sense. So when we were developing this approach, we were really keen that we could develop something that was going to be give a pen side, quick and easy decision for farmers to use. So we have weight handling here and we have a race that the animals work run up. They're all wearing electronic identification tags, which all animals in the UK have to wear anyway. Um, the technology can read the EID tag and link that to a, tar to a weight and our calculations we can upload target or minimum baseline weights into the wayhead and then we can determine from that whether animals have reached that minimum target or not. 
Um, if they haven't reached that target, then we see that they are not performing well and therefore would benefit from a wormer treatment. And so this makes the system simple, easy and quick to use. Up until this point, we've been doing the calculations in-house and we've worked with a small number of farmers. But obviously that's not sustainable in the long term. So we've been lucky enough to get some funding from Innovate UK to work on a project called Smart Sheep. And the hope is that we have been working with a range of really excellent people to develop um, software and apps that will allow us to do those calculations um, on a web or cloud-based system, which will allow more farmers to have access to it. Um, that project's underway now and we're just going to validate it by testing it on 16 farms throughout the UK in the next few weeks. Kirkton and Octatyre are SRUC's major research hill farms in the West Highlands. Based near Crianlarich, the farm covers 2,200 hectares of hill ground and the livestock, like much of the highlands of Scotland, is concentrated on hill sheep. David McCracken, I head up the Hill and Mountain Research Centre that's based here at Kirkton and Octotire Farms. Uh, I'm also the head of a wider Department of Integrated Land Management within SRUC. Future agricultural policy is a hot topic. Why do we need to support hill farms and businesses in less favoured areas? Hill farming and crofting actually covers 70% of Scotland's agricultural land. We are going to need farming in that, this environment to produce beef and lamb for, for the future, but we also need farmers in this environment to be producing much more in the way of other environmental outcomes in, in the future. Going forward, we're going to need a lot more um, environmental management from our uplands. And for management, you need managers. Current and future policy may differ as agriculture moves forward with more focus on the environment. So current policy has been primarily based on the European Common Agricultural Policy. We are now out of Europe, but that historically was supporting farmers for what they could historically produce. We are now in a situation where any public funding, whether it's to farming or any sector of society, has to be justified. And so um, public support for farming in the future will rely on um, knowing what type of goods are being delivered, whether those are agricultural products or whether those are environmental products. What does all this mean to farmers and crofters in the future? As well as thinking of what agricultural products they can produce, it's thinking what else they can be doing on their farms to reduce greenhouse gas emissions, to increase carbon storage, whether it's in peatlands, whether it's in woodlands, and what else they can be doing to actually improve or enhance biodiversity on their farms. We need to have much more of a focus on um, environmental outcomes, management for biodiversity, reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So what practical changes can farmers and crofters make to their business to enhance biodiversity? I head up a Department of Integrated Land Management. So here at Curtin, we've integrated more in the way of biodiversity management, whether it's the wader scrapes or peatland restoration we've done, done on the upland part of the farm, or putting in much more in the way of sort of woodlands. Integrating it with farming, not replacing farming. Public funding is going to come with the need to um, be sure what's been delivered. So there's likely to be much more in the way of environmental conditionality. And that environmental conditionality is likely to be ensuring that farmers and crofters are helping to reduce their greenhouse gas emissions, helping to store more carbon, whether it's in peatlands or woodlands, and actually helping to actually improve um, Scotland's biodiversity. Why do we need to support farmers and crofters with these environmental activities? We are in a climate emergency, we're in a biodiversity crisis um, and the Scottish Government, along with um, other governments across the world, have committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions to net zero by 2045. Farmers and crofters have an important role to play in the delivery um, of those environmental benefits going forward. And what advice is there available to farmers and crofters? There's a wide range of advice available to farmers, particularly here in Scotland. There's a whole host of um, uh, advisory routes out there. And also farmers and crofters across Scotland have access to research and demonstration farms like here at Curtin from an upland point of view, or the Dairy Research Centre down in, in Dumfries, where any sector of Scottish farming society can go to for advice and guidance. For more information on future policy or how to make environmental changes to your farm or croft, please visit faz.scot. So 
we're in early July and the, the weather's warmed up. There's still the odd shower around, um, but calves and, and lambs are, are thriving in the, in, the, in the good weather. Last month we had lots of problems with, with nematodiris in, in lambs, but as the summer progresses, we've got problems anticipated with other gut worms for both lambs and calves. So this warm, wet weather is ideal for, for gut worms. It means they can complete their life cycle more quickly, which means the, the burdens on the pasture can, can build up and reinfect calves and lambs. So it's really important that we're, we're alert to this. Monitoring growth rates can be a really good way to, to tell if the worm burdens are likely to be significant. And that might even show up as, as decreased growth rates even before you see signs of diarrhea. So discuss with your vet monitoring, submission of faecal samples to check for worm eggs and if treatment is necessary, discuss with your vet when the best time to take faecal samples after treatment is to make sure the, the dose has been effective and monitors for signs of resistance. In the second half of the grazing season we're also worried about lungworm in cattle so that causes calves to, to cough and predisposes them to secondary bacterial pneumonia. Again it's the later half of the, the grazing season that this is an issue as contamination can, can build up on the pasture. Usually it's just young cattle that are affected, but we can see really severe outbreaks in adult cattle as well if they've not had the opportunity to build up immunity when they were younger. So prompt identification and treatment of cases is, is really important to minimise losses. We've also got to be vigilant for signs of disease caused by flies as the summer progresses. So with this warm, wet weather, it's again, it's ideal for, for, for fly burdens. So we see issues with summer mastitis in cattle or eye disease conjunctivitis caused by flies spreading bacteria from, from, from one cow to the, to the next. In recent years, we've seen an interesting syndrome that we think is also associated with a, a parasite, a bloodborne parasite, a bacteria really, that's also spread by, by flies. And the, the, the bacteria is called Mycoplasma winyonii. This can cause fever and, and milk drop, but more clearly you can see hind limb edema, so swelling of the hind limbs, or perhaps swelling of the udder and the teats. So this can cause pain, cause the milk drop, and, and perhaps cause um, cows to be uncomfortable when they're, when they're being milked. We've been interested in, in some suspect cases of this in bulls as well. And again, it can cause swelling of the hind limbs and maybe even swelling of the scrotum. So if you do see this condition, if you're suspicious of this condition, speak to your vet and we'll see if we can get samples taken to confirm the diagnosis. The other condition we can see problems with is copper poisoning. If tups have been given perhaps a concentrate that contains copper and also supplements of, of copper. So be careful of, of that one. We also see acidosis every year at, at, in the build up to the sales. So just be aware of these possibilities if changes in diet are being, being implemented and speak to your vet or nutritionist if you're needing advice on how to do this safely. So I hope you have a prosperous summer and we'll be back in September to give you another update then. Hello, I'm Raymond and welcome to the Rural Roundup. This week in farming has seen some very welcome weather allowing second cut silage and even hay to be made in some areas. Remember to get your forages analysed at least six weeks post harvesting to allow winter rationing and feed budgeting to be carried out in good time. For those of you who have submitted a moorland management plan then you are entitled for a grant of between £100 and £600 depending on the area included in the plan. Lowland bog management plans that are greater than 10 hectares are eligible for a £300 grant. The application form can be found on RP online or contact your agent. Also consider soil sampling any fields that are planned for cropping or reseeding next season and address pH and phosphate requirements. Contact your industry representative or your consultant to arrange sampling. There is a new round of funding available from Working for Waders of up to £3,000 for any management or capital project that will benefit wading birds. Visit workingforwaders.com for more information. The Scottish Forestry Small Woodlands Loan Scheme has been released to support small-scale woodland creation projects. The scheme is designed to remove any cash flow barriers and provide a loan of up to 50% of the capital items value on your forestry grant scheme contracts. Woodland creation projects of up to 20 hectares are eligible. Look at forestry.gov.scot for more information. Faz TV is taking a short summer break, but we'll be back on the 23rd of August when we'll be revisiting King's Arms to see this year's lambs go to market. Music